Good morning, everybody. I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry to rush you, but uh, we'd like to start. We are live streaming this since about three minutes ago. And so I don't want to waste too much time because we're trying to get these uh, video recorded so we can put them online, download them to YouTube videos, church website. Uh, Lord willing, with the technical issues that we have or don't have, you'll be able to view these throughout the years to come. We're going to have them on the church website, uh, all, all able to be able to download it and re-looked at and shared with friends and so on and so forth. So. I don't want to take too much time. I want to bring Gary right up because we have a Sunday school hour is usually a Sunday school 45 minutes. And so I want to be able to give you all the time that we can have to hear you speak. And so I'm going to stop speaking and ask Gary if you would come again, brother, and share the word of God with us. Let me just say one thing to you. Uh, I put together a little thing called dramatic theology. It's really theodramatic theology. It kind of gives you a foundation for some of the things. There simply is not time to go through all of this. And so uh, I made, uh, I think they made a, a few copies of this up. We didn't make one for everyone because not everyone is going to read it. But if you're interested, if you see Pastor Bill, then uh, he'll be uh, glad to uh, uh, give you that. Uh, I, I pastored for a number of years in the South, and uh, when Yankees would come down, uh, I'd tell them, there are two things you need to know. Southerners don't talk fast, but Southerners don't listen fast, you know, so it's not just they don't talk fast, they don't listen fast, you know, so I'm glad to be up here where I know you folks listen fast, and uh, we're going to cover the entire t New Testament. You know, in the next, uh, in this hour and the next. Now, we're not going to quite cover everything there, but I, I hope it will give a sense of where we're going. Uh, again, if we had more time, I would love for us just to read through John 1. But I, I want to just point out one of the key texts of Scripture where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, that is really the heart of where we're going. And I want us to uh, uh, take a minute and just kind of go back and get the storyline. Remember, our purpose is to help you understand the flow. We can't cover every detail, but I want you to get the big picture. So, we're going back before anything existed, before Genesis 1-1, there was the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And what did we say characterized that? Love what? Commingle. Love commingled. The Father and the Son, when Jesus said, I want those who belong to me to be with me, that they can see the glory that I had with you before the world began. When at his baptism, this is my beloved Son, this is my boy, I love him at the transfiguration. You know, when God speaks, he communicates. That is the love that is the foundation for everything that's happening. And then, we don't understand how the Father, Son, and Spirit, how this all came about. For us, as we go along, we make a decision, and we do this, and we do this. But the Father, Son, and Spirit have immediate comprehensive knowledge. They didn't learn anything. They didn't decide something along the way. So as a creature, we don't know how all that works. But what we know, before anything existed, there was a Father, a Son, and a Spirit. If you compare that with Allah, you know, can you imagine anyone singing, uh, 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 what was the song, Allah loves me, this I know, you know, for the Quran tells me so. Can you imagine that? Love doesn't fit in that. People don't love Allah. Allah doesn't live love them. It's submission to Allah. And you know why that is? Because a unitary God. You know, if you're by yourself, there's no one to relate to. So the world that he creates, he has to begin to relate to it, and he relates to it as the tyrant, you know, that people are to submit to. But our story doesn't begin that way. It begins with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit 
that love one another. So they create now a world. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the very last verse, and it was very good. And we call that love, love commingled, love expressed. Here is where God is expressing his love. Here's where he's showing his love. Here's where he is uh, uh, sharing his love. And we've chosen the term staging his love. God creates this universe in order that he can stage his love. And, and I said before, you can't understand what God's love is by looking up Greek words. You know, you can learn something, but you're not going to know this until you know the storyline. That is going to tell you what it's all about. And so creation is the point at which God stages his love, and he's going to display it and show it. And he created Adam and Eve as image bearers with a special capacity to see that love, experience that love, and respond to that love. And so we know that God walked with them in the cool of the day, except what happened? Love, what? Love spurned. Instead of loving God and following God, they listened to a liar. Now, you talk about fake news. You know, that didn't start, you know, with the current president that now is in office. You know, that started all the way back in the garden. Satan is the uh, originator of fake news. And he drew them in. And when you read that account, you know, she looked at the fruit. You know, it looked pleasing to the eyes. It was going to, you know, make you uh, uh, like God. And she took it and she gave it to her husband. And you think, boy, this is the end. You know, they really blew it there. And we come to the second act. Now, remember, we're dividing this into five acts. Love commingled is before this whole thing starts. But act one of Cross Theater is love expressed, and a subpoint is love spurned. And then last night, we looked at act two. Act two is what? Love, Promise. love promised. The promise that he made in Genesis 3, promise he made to Abram in Genesis 12, the promise that he made to David, the promise in Jeremiah, the promise in Isaiah, the promise in Ezekiel. Over and over, it's about the promise that a Messiah is going to come. And so the contempt and the disobedience of Adam and Eve and Israel throughout the whole Old Testament is going to provide a backdrop to show the depth of this love. You know, this is not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, puppy love, okay? Just something that I'm going to feel a bit of affection. He's loved us with an everlasting love. You remember what Paul says? Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he gives us a list of things pretty comprehensive. None of that can cancel out. And so you have the promise of a coming Messiah. Now, this morning, we look at the most exciting part of all of this drama, and it is Act 3. Act 1 is love expressed, Act 2 is love promised, Act 3 is what? Love fulfilled. Does God keep his promises? You know, that becomes the central question. God's love and, and I tell you, I'm way in over my head this morning. I don't even know how to share some of the things I felt in my own heart about this. It is absolutely overwhelming. So whatever I'm going to say, you just tell people, go read it for yourselves a whole lot better than what he, however he's able to articulate it. But there's something powerful here. How is God going to show his love? Is he going to send a tweet, you know, or a text? you know, or an email, you know, or a video, or an angel, or a man. What's he going to do? He's going to go himself. You know, if you got to get the job done right, you got to do it yourself. Well, that's the way God is. And so love fulfilled is the heart of this. It is the very center of Cross Theater, where God is incarnated. You know, God takes on not just a human body, but becomes a human person. We call it theanthropos, God-man, 
combine together. And again, if we had time, boy, it would be great to talk about the, the five parts of the incarnation of Christ, the humanity, the deity, the uh, hypostatic union, the unipersonality of Christ, the kenosis. All of those are wrestling. How, how, how does God get to be man? You know, let's say, for instance, I'll pick on my friend Don Moffat back there. Uh, Don Moffat has a great love for roaches, and he feels like they get bad press. So he decides he wants to rescue them, so he decides to become a roach. Are you going to go with him, Dee? Uh, you're, okay, you're alone on this one, Don. Now, imagine what it would be like to go from being a person to a roach. Now, most of us cringe at that a little, but that's nothing compared to being God and becoming man. We don't even know how to process that. You know, we don't know what that's like, but God's going to show his love. We can't climb up into heaven and peek in the windows and see what that's like. So you know what God does? He brings it down to us, and he's going to do that in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And we read that passage, we're going to go back to it to uh, look at it just quickly in 1 John 4, where he says, in this is love. Not that we love God, it's not initiated from our side, but what? But God loved us. And we know that he loved us by the fact that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He says that a couple of times in this passage. The cross... Here now, hear this, very, very crucial point. The cross is the center of cross theater. Uh, 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 everything that happens in the incarnation from the birth of Christ until his ascension into heaven, this is God keeping the promise that he makes. And the Son of God becomes both the victim and the victor. You ever thought about that? The lion and the lamb is the term that uh, John uses. He is the victim, the lamb, that becomes the victor. You read uh, Revelation 4 and 5, at the very center of the throne, there's the lamb standing that's been slain. You know, and so this is the heart of, uh, uh, of the gospel. And I want us to try to walk through this today. And for us to do that, I'm not, you won't have time to look up the passages, but most of the passages that I'm going to be referring to, you already will know, but I want you to get the big picture. You remember when Malachi ends, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. It's pointing forward. The whole posture of the Old Testament was what? Waiting, hoping, expecting for the Messiah to arrive. So we have 400 years of silence from the time of Malachi until the day in the temple that Zechariah, you can read this in Luke chapter 1, he goes in to offer uh, up the, uh, uh, the incense before the Lord, and what happens? An angel shows up and says, your wife, Elizabeth, uh, too old to have children, she's going to have a child. And he says, what? How can I be sure of this? And so he silences him until the baby's born. So Zechariah comes out, and they figure he saw something in there. And, and what does he promise? Any of you remember Ed McMahon? He was famous for one line. What was it? Here's Johnny. Well... John the Baptist is coming along, and he's going to be famous for one line. You know what it is? Here's the Messiah. You know, he's, a, he's a, going to prepare the way. He's going to make straight paths. And it's like after 400 years of silence, all of a sudden, you know, the whole thing begins to shake. And Zechariah goes back and, you know, I, I guess he wrote it down with his wife, but he communicated and says, honey, we're going to have a baby. Can you imagine? Wouldn't you like to be there to hear that conversation? We're not told what he said, but I, I, I don't know women very well, but I've learned a few things after being married to one for almost 50 years, and I have an idea of what that conversation was like. 
But the next thing you know, Elizabeth is carrying a child. And at the very time that she's carrying this child, another angel shows up. And when I was home recently and I saw my birth announcement, you know, that was a big deal to about six people. You know, but it was not like an angel that came, you know, and stars in the sky and shepherds and what. I mean, I didn't have any of that when I was born. Well, you guys aren't much better off. You know, I didn't never saw the angels and the stars. It's not the same, is it? And I want you to, you, you got to turn to this passage. There's some words that you know it, but you got to look at it and you got to feel it in your heart. I love this passage of scripture. Luke chapter 1. Here's this young virgin, Mary, betrothed to a man named Joseph. We read about that account in Matthew 1. And let's pick up in, uh, uh, let's see, let's pick up in, in verse 26. In the sixth month, that is of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee. Now who's behind this? God is sending an angel to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Hmm, is that coincidental? Uh, does that fit in the scheme of things? Remember what he promised to David? I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you a son. He's going to sit on the throne. Well, it just so happens the, uh, uh, Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, you know the pictures we've seen of angels. It's kind of chubby cheeks. You just want to go up and pinch their cheeks. You read the Bible, nobody wanted to go up and pinch their cheeks. They're scared to death. I mean, it was an awesome thing to be in the presence of an angel. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. She doesn't grant favor. She found favor. Big difference between evangelical and Catholic theology on that. You will be with child. Now listen to this. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Joshua. Jesus, Joshua. Jesus is the Greek. Joshua is the Old Testament. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. What an amazing statement. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Remember the promise to Abraham, promise to David, the promise that referred to over, this is the one that I've been promising. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. You remember, Mary said, wait a minute, how, how can this be? I'm not married yet. I'm betrothed. You know, that was kind of like, a, you know, uh, uh, engagement on steroids. It was a lot stronger than what our engagement is. But, you know, I'm not going to have a baby. I love this passage. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, how do you process that? You know, here is this young girl, and God is saying things to her through the angel that the greatest theologians have never plumbed. You're going to have a baby. This baby is going to be the Messiah. This is the one I've been talking about. This is the one that I have promised all along. Now, Mary begins to fill out a little. And Joseph says, hmm, something's going on here. That's not my baby. And I know how babies come about. And so, you know, I, I've got I to gotta put her away. It, 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 and then uh, uh, the relationship that they had of being betrothed required a divorce. I'm going to have to divorce her. But he was a good man. He wanted to do it quietly so as not to embarrass her. And he goes to sleep one night, and what happens? And it's not because of pepperoni pizza, you know, that he has these things spinning in his head. An angel comes to him and says, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. That which is conceived in her is from me. This is the one who's going to save his people from their sin. 
And he got up and he took Mary, and the scripture says he didn't know her until this child was born. Now put the pieces together. Here's Zacharias getting an, an angel comes. And Mary, the angel comes. Angel comes to Joseph. And then you go to Luke chapter 2. You know, we, we, we need the whole Christmas season every year to go through this and appreciate this. And here we read the account of, of the birth of Christ. You know, no place to stay, so they put him in a barn. You know, as a kid, I thought, oh, this is the neatest thing. You know, this quaint little, you know, stable with the, the, the sheep around and, you know, uh, and this fresh hay. And, and it was a barn. And they laid them in a feed trough, and they wrapped them in these rough cloths. That's all they had. You guys are rich compared to what they had. You know, and we look at that and say, now that's not the way I would have done it. If the Messiah were coming, man, it would be better than the royal babies, you know, in the Buckingham Palace. And yet, God's going to show his, way, his love in a way that we never could have imagined. So who does he appear to, first of all? Where do the angels go? Do they go to the theologians? Do they, you know, go to the prophets? You know where they go? To the shepherds. And you read this account. They're out there minding their own business, watching the sheep. And the next thing you know, there is this chorus of angels. It absolutely blows their mind. The angel said, don't be afraid. Same thing he said to Mary. Angels always say that because they're scary because of the authority that's on them. Today, in the town of David, huh, coincidental, right? In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah. That's what they've been waiting for. Yahweh, the Lord, you can't say it any stronger than that. This will be a sign. You'll find the baby wrapped in, um, wrapped in claws, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels. Now, it's angels, and we don't even know exactly what these are. And what are they saying? In fact, it doesn't even say singing. It says they were saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. They're totally amazed. They got to go back. They got to go in and see this thing. They see this baby that God had told them about, and they go out and they begin to tell. But even before that happened, there are these magi in the east. Who are they? We're not quite sure, but interesting characters. And they see the star in the east, and they come. Uh, and you know the story with Herod. Herod wants him to find the baby so he can come and worship him, sure. You know? uh, and understand, this whole thing is being contested by Satan. Underneath the love story of God's love is the hatred and the malice of Satan that's going to resist at every point. You know, have you heard that term in our political uh, uh, realm, resist? Resist, resist. Well, that's Satan's approach. Resist, 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 resist. The Magi come and they deliver the gifts and they go out a different way. And then you got to read the account. They go in, you know, to follow the procedures of the law. And here's Simeon, you know, this godly man that takes this baby in his arms. And you have this praise to God. Uh, 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 the the uh, 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 Simeon song is one of the great hymns in the Old Testament. You know, and then up comes Anna and takes this baby. And you say, what's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. God is staging his love. And Jesus' arrival onto, uh, into this planet, into to human life, the incarnation, we call it the advent, the arrival of Jesus Christ, God and man united in one person uh, that uh, has humbled himself. Read the passage in Philippians 2, and God raised him up. You read the account, we don't know much about his childhood. There's a lot of fictional stuff told, you know. He had a, a bird that he'd made and, you know, in his hand out of paper mache or whatever they used, and he threw up in the air and it flew away. No, that didn't happen. 
The only thing we read about him going to the temple and baffling the scribes with the wisdom that he had, and his parents come back and, and took him uh, back with them. He submitted themselves until his baptism. And he moves from this public, he grew in wisdom and stature among men and, among, uh, and before God, and the baptism takes place. Here he comes to John the Baptist. Wouldn't you love to have seen John the Baptist's ministry? It was riveting. And he comes to John and says, I need to be baptized by you. And he says, no, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, no. And this is one of the most compelling statements in all of scripture. Here's where you see God the Father speaking from heaven. This is my son whom I love. Isn't that what that all started out? And the son that he loved, he's not sending an angel, he's not sending a video, he's not sending a tweet. He's sending his son because that's the only way that God's love is ever going to be fully communicated. Everything else would be too cheap. God's not going to give us stuff. He's going to give us himself. And so the fulfillment of the promise is the Son of God comes at his baptism. There is the Father speaking out. You remember the devil led him into the wilderness, you know, or, or God led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And there is the, 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 the spiritual warfare, and everyone else has wilted before the wiles of the evil one, not this one. And three times he turns him away. And what do you have? You're back to the garden. I wish we had time. So much of what's happening there on the mountain, go back to the garden and what was happening. And if you want to read something that will really blow your mind, read C.S. Lewis's Paralandra, uh, where you have the story of uh, uh, Mars, uh, I'm sorry, and Venus and the Green Lady and, and a reliving of this temptation, but she doesn't fall. There's a part at the end where you have the dance of life. Every time I read through it, I go back and read to that chapter four or five times. It is, it is an echo of exactly what's happening right here. He trains 12 fishermen. You know, these are the blue collar guys. You know, not the academics, the blue collar guys. He pours his life into him. He goes about preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. John said it's coming. Jesus said it's here. You know, and they said, well, you're casting out uh, demons by uh, 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 what you're doing is the very power of Satan. And he says, no, it's the kingdom of God has come upon you. If I'm doing these things, it's because God is at work. Remember the Sermon on the Mount, the messages that he preached? You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. You, you, you don't just hear it, you feel it. Go through the book of John, the book of healing. You know, the, the, the woman at the well, the, the, the cripple, the blind man, over and over again, you see the heart. What is that an expression of? It's an expression of God's love. And you see, now he is going to, everything he promised, he's delivering on. You go to the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13. You know, what glorious statements of truth. What is this mystery of the kingdom? He's giving these in, in parable form because he intends to communicate this to some and hide it from others. And it's the, the hidden nature, the kingdoms come, but it's not here. It's the already and the not yet concept. And he opens that up, the parable of the sower and the seed, and uh, you know all of those. Jesus is speaking, but in the very midst of this, what happens? Everybody loving him and following him? No, the opposition is growing, you know, and the opposition is pushing against him. And I, I wish we had uh, the time just to go through John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. These are the passages in the very last week of the life of Jesus Christ. He takes off his, his outer garment, puts a towel, and starts washing their feet. Blows Peter's mind. He said, not me. And Jesus said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you've got no part. And he said, well, my head and my hands and my feet, the whole thing. What's Jesus doing there? 
John chapter 14 is one of the passages that's impacted my life. And one of the reasons, when I was a boy, my dad and I memorized that passage together. In fact, we had a contest. Whoever got through John 14 first, I don't remember the prize, but I got it. I memorized John 14 and 15 before I got the first half of John 14. But I'll tell you what, every time I read those words, I see my dad, I see the love that he had for God. <laughs> and I see how God planted that love in his heart. How that was shared with me, just a simple thing of reading through God's word and memorizing it together. I read those words. Let not your heart be troubled. Trust, trust God now, trust me. What's this all about? It's God now bringing somebody who could show love in a way that no one else would ever be able to do that. And that touched my heart because that love touched my granddad and through him it touched my dad and through the, my dad it touched me and I pass that on to my son, and hopefully my grandchildren are going to enjoy that same thing. What's this all about? Well, it's about God keeping his promise, sending somebody that is able to do this. But the opposition grows, and you remember it all ends with a kiss, right? But a kiss of betrayal. Jesus is there in the garden. I can't read the passage without my heart just, just uh, uh, throbbing with a sense of, of, of awe that here is the Son of God. It's crying out, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, that's exactly what I would have said. But how did he finish it? But not my will but yours be done. You know that song, when Jesus died, he was thinking about you on the cross? Let me tell you, he's thinking about his father, first of all. He wanted to please his father. And we were on his mind, but we we're on his mind because those are the ones the father loved, and he was about to finish that task. And so they came and they took him away. You talk about a mistrial. I mean, it makes the FBI and the DOJ and all the rest look like, you know, uh, kindergarten stuff. And they frame him, and he stands before Pilate. Now, Pilate's in charge, right? So Pilate's questioning him, and uh, uh, he's not answering a word. And finally, Pilate says, well, you know, are, are you a king? And Jesus says, yeah, I'm a king. And before it gets over, Pilate says, listen, don't you know that I have authority? He said, no. You don't have authority to do anything. God's the one that has this authority. There's no question who's in charge. You know, you read this account and you say, what's this all about? It's about God showing his love. And you say, man, it can't get any better than this. Look at this. You know, the soldiers come to arrest him. He said, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, ego a me, I am. Poof, they fall over on the ground. I read some of the commentaries. You know, well, they were so surprised, they just fell down, you know, in fright. No, that's not what it was. He just opened a little bit, you know, the corner of his robe, and the glory and the love and the power of God shone out, and they were smitten before. They couldn't do anything. Pilate couldn't do anything. Nobody takes this life from me. I lay it down of myself. You know the trial. They condemn him. And they take him. And you talk about, I don't know how to begin to describe just the humiliation, the pain, the shame, the horror, that he could have walked away. He could have snapped his fingers and turned everyone into a stone statue. And you remember on the cross, they're jeering at him, the one that said he's going to build this temple uh, in uh, three days. Uh, come down, you know, then we'll believe you. Boy, if I had been there, I would want to do something to show them and then lay down. But that's not how God loves work. That, think about this. With a battle between Satan and Christ throughout, don't you expect there's going to be a duel at the end? 
you know, they're going to get pistols and they're going to, you know, walk 10 steps and turn around, boom. But this battle is not going to be won with a pistol, with a sword fight. It's going to be won by laying himself, by a willing sacrifice. Read the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan on the Stone Table. It's, it's an echo of this very story. It's not a different story. That's the very story that he's talking about here. And so the Son of God is put on the cross. Where does God's glory shine brightest? It is right there on the cross. That's where God glorified his Son. Now we have a hard time wrapping our head around that, but that's the story. That's what this is all about. That's how God's going to show his love. How does he show his love? By taking all of God's wrath and focusing that on his Son. It's as if the sun is an umbrella and the wrath of God is falling and he absorbs all of God's wrath. So those that are under the umbrella, we're safe. Why? Because the wrath stopped falling? No, but because he absorbed it for us. Now this is love. It's not that we love God, but what is it that God loved us? And he sent his son not just to show up and have a chat with us. He sent his son to take our place. We should have been there. We're the ones that deserve God's wrath, but he took it. We call that substitutionary atonement. That's what Isaiah 53 is all about. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord laid on him whose iniquity? The iniquity of us all. I don't know how to begin to explain what that kind of love looks like. I remember as a boy being impressed with the story of Abraham. I'm going through the book of James now, and there's a section in there about, uh, you know, uh, Abraham demonstrated, you know, his justification by sacrificing his son. Remember the story? And he has his son. They go up to the altar, and he binds him, and he has the knife raised, and then God says, stop and there's a ram over there, and the son lives. But now, it's not the Jews, it's not the Romans, not the Gentiles, not the Samaritans, but you know who has the knife in the hand? It's his own father. It's God the Father. And there's no hand that can take that and say, wait a minute, you know, here is a substitute. And so, think about this. Love looks like God sending his own son, the son that he loved more than we know how to express. And he takes the wrath of God because of sin. And on the cross, go back and read the account. You know, uh, uh, he did not die a derelict. He did not die as a broken man. You remember, he cried out in a loud voice. People dying on the cross don't cry out with a loud voice. They wanted you to know he's laying down his life. And what does it say? He gave up his spirit. And they put him in a stone-cold tomb. And all of them were dejected. Read Luke 24. And you see how they felt. This is the one that we hoped in. This is the fulfillment. And now, he's dead. Everything we hope for is lost. If you go back and read the number of times he told them what was going to happen, he's just like most husbands with their wives in the morning. They heard everything he said but didn't listen to a word of it. They heard, he told them again and again, but they never heard it. Thomas, poor Thomas, doubting Thomas. Now, you tell me, which of the other disciples were there on that first day of the week to see the resurrection? You know, none of them are there. Now, friends, we call this, you know, there, there is the pre-incarnate glory of Christ. We don't know all that that looked like, but then we call this the time of his humiliation from the conception in the womb of the Mary uh, and the Virgin Mary until his death there on the cross, and they lay him in the tomb. The Apostles' Creed rehearses that for us. Friends, 
if you don't know that part of the story, you know, just as I said, you got to get the whole thing, and you can't appreciate that until you see how we got there. God is keeping the promise that he made, and that promise is in his son. Now, I don't have a watch. What time do we have here? Are we about... What time we have to finish? Okay, go with me. We'll, we'll finish with 1 John 4. We started with this. And I want you to see this again in view of what was said. I hope this becomes richer to you as you read this. Verse 7 of 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another. Now we're going to come to that part in the next section. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That is his essence. This is how God showed his love. God doesn't just feel love, he shows it. He stages his love. I'm going to go back and change the, the word there to staging. This is how God stages his love among us. How does he do that? How does God show his love? He sent his one and only son into the world. Now, not only was it an incarnation, it was an intemporization in flesh, in time, in our world. He came into that. That's what God loves look like. I've had people say, well, if God loved me, I say, wait a minute. God doesn't have to ever again do anything to prove that he loves you. Here it is right here. This is love. Do you see that? This is love. What? This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation, took God's wrath. That's what propitiation means for our sins. Now, you have a neighbor that doesn't know Christ, doesn't know the gospel. Now, this is a whole lot better than taking them to the movie or going to a ball game. They need to hear this story. They need to hear this come out of your heart and know what it's done to your heart. Just tell them the story of how God is staging his love, and he doesn't do it with an angel or a video. He does it by coming himself. Dear friends, since God loved us, we ought to love one another. Well, we're coming back to that in the next section. But go down a little bit further. God is love. We're down in verse 16. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Love is made complete among us that we uh, have confidence, that we all have confidence in the day of judgment because in this we're like him in the world. Go down to verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Do you see this? When I talk about staging God's love, that's not just a cool thing that I came up with. I'm simply trying to put in words what we read in the scripture. That's what the gospel is. What's the gospel? It's God staging his love. And he stages, he shows it, he shares it, he displays it there at the cross. That blows my mind. I, I have, you know, uh, any of you like the Rambo movies? You know, I love the Rambo movies because, you know, these idiots, you want somebody to come by and going to knock their heads. And I confess that at times I want to Rambo Jesus. I want him to come in there and knock some heads, straighten some people out and make things right. You ever feel that way? We got somebody better than a Rambo Jesus. God didn't send somebody to knock heads. He's going to do that at the end in a just and right way. He sent somebody to show his love. You remember John 3, 16? You ever heard that verse? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, this is the story that people need to hear. This is the gospel. Not just you're a sinner and you need to be saved. That's true, but that's not the gospel. This is the good news. This is what God did. And when he did this, he staged, he displayed, he showed his love. And can you believe he made us to be part of that? And nobody here that deserves that. 
all of us should have been cast aside. God's love is not some esoteric concept that we debate. It's something that you feel in your heart. Now, my wife loves cookbooks. She loves to read cookbooks. She'll sit there all day, you know, and read cookbooks, and then we'll get jello for supper because she's too tired out. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't want to look at a piece of blueberry pie. You know, I don't want to look at a picture of a Reuben sandwich. I want to go to Ken's house. I want to get it between my teeth. I want to smell it. I want to taste it. I want to swallow it. I want to enjoy that. And listen, I think sometimes we take the love of God and make it a concept that we debate. It's not intended to be that. It's intended to be tasted and enjoyed and swallowed and experienced. That's what this is all about. It's not about getting us life insurance from hell. It's about bringing us into communion so we can share and we can enjoy God's love. You can take a pair of glasses and you can measure them, you can weigh them, you can figure out the content of what's in there, you can talk about the, the style, you can talk about the lenses and, and all of that. Is that what these were designed for? To be something we talk about? Aren't they designed to put on so you can see? And friends, listen to me. The Bible it's not just something that we put under a microscope and we evaluate and we dissect it and we explain it. This is something to be tasted and swallowed and enjoyed because it's all about God's love from beginning to end. God's love commingled. We don't even know what that looks like. And then in creation, his love is expressed in a remarkable way but the first couple spurn that love. But rather than turn God away, it gives an opportunity to make some promises that are remarkable. But the promises are nothing in comparison to the fulfillment. Jesus Christ comes. Remember what he says in 2 Corinthians, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That's what God gave to us himself. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that you would enable us not just to cognitively process all of these thoughts and some kind of a, a systematic explanation of the atonement, but Father, I, I pray it would be like the piece of blueberry pie, the Reuben sandwich that we taste and we enjoy. And Lord, I pray that God's love would not be an abstract concept that we debate, but it would be a reality that we come to experience. Father, how do we ever begin to say thank you for sending your Son, giving us this indescribable gift? Father, we praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.